Good morning, and welcome back to our series, Parenting with the Experts. Um, over this uh, winter quarter, this series, we have been interviewing uh, about a dozen different people uh, over specific topics about Christian parenting. Some of these have been very general um, about any child and any household, as it can uh, relate to everybody. Some have been a bit more specific into either hot topics or trending issues of the day. Um, and today we find ourselves kind of somewhere in the middle with a topic that uh, you might not apply to all families. Hopefully the prayer is that it doesn't, um, but the uh, fear is that it might. And absolutely every family who has children in their household uh, needs to be preparing themselves and thinking about it. Um, today we're beginning a conversation of what to do when your child falls away from the faith. Uh, but before we dive right into our topic, I'm joined with Phil Sanders. Um, Phil and I met uh, about a year and a half ago now, I think, and um, it was wonderful getting to know him. But for anyone who's familiar with your name, which I would assume is uh, is many people, uh, can you give us a, a refresher? Who are you? How might we be familiar with you? Okay. Um, I, uh, I've i been a minister for a little over 40, excuse me, a little over 50 years. Um, I'm probably most well known this day and time as a the speaker for In Search of the Lord's Way a television ministry that does go out all over the United States and several other countries. Um, I have been a, a trainer of preachers for many years, uh, for over 20 years. I've taught in Amherst University, National School of Preaching, Georgia School of Theology, Georgia School of Preaching. I've taught in Seoul Bible Institute and Asian Christian University. I've lectured in many uh, colleges and schools of preaching, and I've written several books. So. I've stayed busy over the years, and I've been a minister since 1971, almost wow. 52 years, starting wow. January. Well, it's a, it really is a huge blessing to have you with us uh, and to get some of your wisdom and some of your thoughts around this topic. Um, as I mentioned, we're talking about uh, this issue of what to do when your child falls away from the faith, and I think whether you've got uh, young children who are still babes in arms, or if you have adult children, uh, this is something that should be either at the back or the forefront of any parent's mind at any given time uh, to either be preparing for and shoring up against this possibility or for, uh, unfortunately, I think a large percent of our families in the church today, what is a present reality. Um, so there's a lot to, to dive into between the, the preparation of you know, what to do when your family's still in the household and what to do when this is actually uh, a, a reality for you. But as we dive into it, um, Phil, I want to ask to your to your comfort level, what experience do you have in, in this throughout the course of your, your ministry? Well, I began, of course, many years ago as, as a youth minister for a few years, and then I transitioned into to preaching uh, in 1974. And I've done that up until I moved to uh, Edmund 14 years ago and began my work on this. But during that time, um, I have four children who are now all in their 40s and 12 grandchildren. So I have a lot of uh, a lot of family and uh, a big family. Uh, I've worked with young people all through the years and spoken to them and spoken with their parents. I've done parenting classes, uh, some at Fisher and Kenny in years past. And, and so those are things that have been very important to me. I was kind of looking through some of my notes today, and I had forgotten just how much I had done through the years as far as preparing for the Christian family, both marriage and in parenting. But uh, yes, I, I've, I've spent a great deal of time preparing for this, but from a personal standpoint, I've watched my own children grow up and have children of their own. And uh, I tried to provide the best that I could for my children as they were growing up. We were in church all of the time. Uh, they went to camp. They went on campaigns. They worked for the Lord. We did all kinds of special events. Uh, my four children have all been on campaigns, both domestic and foreign. And I'm very proud of, of my, my four daughters. And uh, three of them are married and have uh, husbands who are people who uh, I think are fine people. Uh, I do have one daughter, however, uh, through this period of time that uh, decided that she felt like there was something other than the churches of Christ that she wanted to be a part of. And uh, 
that was a great, uh, of course, heartache for me. She did this not as a teenager or even as a college student, but after she had married and had children of her own and made a decision to, to leave the church and to be a part of a different religious group. And of course, that was uh, probably the greatest heartache of my life. Yeah, well, I appreciate your um, your transparency about it. And as we uh, go through some of the the more general questions in this topic and and the more specific ones, um, I'm just thankful for the the wealth of experience that you have and and the preparation and training that you've put into into studying this. I know that in um, in youth ministry, uh, retention after high school is something that is a, a big priority and a big concern. If you are putting in all of the the time and energy uh, just for it to not, um, you know, not end up in faithful Christians, um, it, it really is discouraging. And I can't imagine from a, a parent standpoint um, how much more difficult it is when it is your own children. Um, but from a, a congregational standpoint, I know there are some statistics out there and some uh, research groups that have done some studies into this, but uh, in your experience, how common is this in the church? And how do you think the church handles situations like this? I, I think it, it varies with the, the personality of the congregation. That's the best way I know to put it in a simple way. A number of years ago, Flavel Yakely did a study of uh, kids who fall away from the church. And one of the things that he, he found out is that churches that describe themselves as being far right would lose about 60% of their kids. Right. And churches that describe themselves as being far left, very progressive, would lose about 60% of their kids. Hmm. Now, those on the right would lose their kids to the world because nobody would be good enough. And uh, those that were on the left usually lost their children to um, groups like community churches. Not always, but many of them would lose in that group. Um, those that were in the middle, uh, those that were uh, still uh, holding to the truth, but not on either extreme, uh, for the most part, were keeping their kids. Uh, they would keep uh, all but about 36 percent but of that 36 percent uh, yes they would wander away when they went to their first jobs and left home and uh, went to college that kind of thing but often they would come back uh, once they married or once they started having children of their own mm -hmm. in fact about a third of those who left came back so on the whole according to the research that I saw we were keeping just about three fourths of the kids for those that were in uh, the more mainstream mm. of, of churches of Christ. Mm. Uh, so from that standpoint, that's pretty high compared to most. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. That you, well. Yeah, very interesting that you mentioned those. I've heard um, similar rates of, of people in that 18 to 25 range leaving the church. Um, and returning to the church when they get into their early 30s. Um, but I hadn't heard before the disparity between uh, if your church has sound doctrine versus being far right or far left. And it almost sounds like the actualization of the ideal of Jesus teaching that good teaching will bear good fruit. And that if your congregation has doctrine that's difficult to palate uh, or is or is bad teaching that as students are leaving that church and getting into different atmospheres, uh, it turns into a different kind of fruit than if they are being taught consistent biblical doctrine that when they enter into the world really checks out with uh, with their experience. Well, the the sound doctrine that's being taught and the balanced way that it's presented has an awful lot to do with how children see Christianity. A balanced faith, there's just no, there's no substitute for a balanced faith that has not only true doctrine, but also has true passion and commitment and uh, takes things seriously. Uh, and, and yet there's a lot of love there. And I, I think whenever you have young people growing up with loving families and loving churches that hold to the truth, they have the best, they have the best chance of remaining faithful. Mm-hmm. And, and that's as much as I know to say. 
Well, I know that um, I already mentioned uh, one age group that I think the church tends to focus very heavily on around this conversation, that 18 to 25, sometimes 18 to 29. Um, but taking a step back from the preconceived notions that we have around this conversation, uh, in your opinion, what age group is this most likely to occur when a child will um, either fall away from the faith or start the beginning steps of falling away from faith? And then do you see a difference as a parent of an age that is more at risk than others? There are two or three periods, I think, that really are are significant. And, and let me go through the three of them that I think are significant. The first one is when a child gets to be about the sixth grade. Uh, this is when they are in school. And if they're in a public school and their teachers beginning to teach about evolution and many other things, these things can create a real problem with a child early on. And uh, you may not realize it, but it's there. And so one of the things that I make suggestion to parents is that they start teaching their children uh, things that relate to Christian evidences when they're quite young, even third, fourth, fifth grade is not too young to start talking about God made these. And yes, even dinosaurs were made by God and um, uh, those kinds of things. And these children are going to hear on TV. They're going to hear at school billions of years of this and millions of years of that. And of course, it's pretty hard to uh, to uh, talk about thousands of years since the beginning of the world and millions and billions of years. There's just a, a big difference between those two concepts. And there are so many things that I think start at that age when the doubt begins to begin. And this is where this is where good parents will purchase books that will help children to understand. Um, uh, there is an awful lot that's offered by Apologetics Press out of Montgomery, Alabama. And I would urge parents to start buying books that would be of, of great value to the grandchildren that come out of Apologetic Press and other, other places that, that do that. Um, mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things that happen. The second period of time where you have a great challenge is when that 16, 17 year old uh, gets a car or gets a job, starts making their own money. Mm -hmm. uh, it was always obvious to me as a youth minister that whenever a, a, a young person began to be 16, 17 years old, and they had a car and they had a job, that their involvement in church matters was very much secondary and sometimes left out. They were too busy for this or too busy for that. And their world and their friends became somebody different than the friends that they had at church. So that's a second time when, when we have to really kind of watch out for and of course, the third time is when they leave home and go to college, a state school. Many of them can be incredibly immoral behavior, uh, not necessarily from the school, but from many of their classmates and such. And it's very difficult. The other problem is that many times uh, people will go to a Christian college expecting that their child will have a Christian education. And what happens is that in some Christian schools, some Christian universities, there is so much doubt that is put in their minds about uh, the authority and the inerrancy of scripture, right. or uh, there have been a few schools that uh, now no longer believe in the restoration plea. And uh, whenever you kill the faith that a college student has, either in the restoration plea or in the inerrancy and inspiration of scripture, and of course it's authority, then what happens is they start looking around for other alternatives. Hmm. And uh, that has happened among some of our schools, unfortunately, hmm. and it has created a, a problem. Uh, the other aspect, of course, the moral aspect, the uh, teaching that you have uh, in colleges, many of them, the larger universities are far more uh, woke than we would like, and because of all of that, all of this change in thinking is there. Let's remember two or three things. Number one is that uh, Christianity is now in the minority. People who say they belong to 
a religious group in America is now around 47, 48%. Hmm. It's in the minority. Uh, and among those who are uh, millennials, uh, people between the ages of 18 and 29 in that particular time, uh, there was one particular survey I saw recently that really uh, struck me. And that is that we used to talk about the nuns, you know, people who are non-affiliated. But did you know that there are some don'ts? Now that's the name that's used to describe a certain group of people. They are, they are the don'ts. And uh, there are three categories of these don'ts. The first one is they don't believe in God. And that would be around eight, nine percent. Then you have those who uh, don't believe that we can know anything about God, the agnostics, and that would be an, another eight or nine percent. Hmm. But the biggest category of the don'ts is not the don't believe in God and I uh, don't know God, but the don't care. Hmm. And of millennials, 41 percent, 41 percent of millennials are among the don'ts. This is according to uh, research done by the Arizona uh, Christian University. Uh, hmm. George Barner is the director hmm. of that research facility. Hmm. It wow. shocked me when I read that this summer. And uh, uh, because I, I, I see so much of that, uh, so many young people just don't care. Hmm. They, they uh, have never seen the cross or they don't care about looking at the cross anymore. Hmm. And I would think the prodigal son probably was a don't until he didn't have anything to eat. And sometimes it takes a, a brutal event in a person's life before they come to their senses. And, right. and I think that goes hand in hand with um, one of the statistics that you were sharing earlier about the percent of students who will fall away, but then return. And yes. whether it's a, a brutal event or just kind of the natural sequence of life that gets more serious as you get older and you have uh, a family of your own and you start oh, yeah. to get on in age and looking ahead towards the end of life that maybe those don'ts can naturally change a bit. But in terms oh. of families and in terms of churches, um, I really want to focus on ways that we can intentionally be involved in that change. Well, I, I think this is, yeah, I think this is where we have to to develop a relationship with them. Uh, even when they don't care, we, we need to be there. And, and sometimes just being there when they need you, being there and always being at hand is something that can be done when, when people begin to stray in directions where uh, you won't go and they know you won't go, but they are willing to go. But whenever something happens, then you're there. Sometimes uh, the, the death of a friend, the death of a loved one, can begin to make people stop and, and think uh, about their lives. Uh, any time of uh, any time you have difficulties in life, and someone is there to just put an arm around you, and and be a kind, empathetic person. Uh, sometimes they will listen. Sometimes they won't. But you can break through that barrier of not caring. You know, the, the devil has his way of, has his way of snatching the word out of people's hearts. Uh, the parable of the sower talks about how the devil snatches the word and they don't come to faith. And sometimes that happens with young people, even in college. Then there are those that whenever the peer pressure and the problems of life become so difficult, uh, they don't have those deep roots that they need that should have been planted earlier. You cannot wait until people are teenagers to start planting those roots. It needs to be done when they're in third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. That's when you start planting. That's when you start counseling. That's when you start giving them the Christian evidences. That needs to start early. If you wait until they fall away, uh, they may or may not listen. So my, my thinking in dealing with this is the best thing to do is to give them the resources that they need. Mm -hmm. We have more resources in the area of apologetics right now mm -hmm. than we have had at any time in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I can remember when I could only count on maybe one hand the number of apologetic books I had available. Wow. 
And now I have hundreds, literally hundreds in many different subjects. Mm -hmm. And so uh, th this is one of the things that you need to do in order to be able to help people to work through the problems that they have. There is nothing bad about a person having a doubt. What is bad is whenever this doubt begins to work its way of bringing about unbelief and there is no suggestion and no one saying to them, I, I know, you know, I, I have, I understand what you're saying, but you know what? I think there's some answers to this. And let me point you to a book that can give you the answers. Mm -hmm. uh, young people don't want to be told, but if they can discover something for themselves mm -hmm. by your bringing to them a, uh, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful book or some kind of information that is very helpful then you have a situation where you've got an opportunity to make a difference. Hmm. And that's one of the things that, that I would say, and that needs to go on uh, regardless of what else is there. Um, we've not talked about moral problems, but a lot of times uh, when, when you have a lack of faith, it is very easy to jettison the morals. Right. And, and, and so they really go very much hand in hand. And this is why, Building faith in young people, building habits of involvement, of good worship, of good life, of loving them, of being able to forgive them. You know, if mom and dad can't forgive their kid, then they may assume that God can't forgive them either. And I think we have to be very careful to always have this, yes, a sternness of what we believe but also a compassion hmm. uh, when, you know, if, if you spank a child or if you punish a child in some other way, when it's over, it's over. And you love that child. The prodigal son's father was waiting for the son to come home, but the son had to come to his senses before he would come home. Hmm. And sometimes a parent has to be patient, hmm. praying to God, hoping that some event will take place where they will begin to wake up and see mm. what they need to know. So I'm hearing you say that there's a, a lot of necessary emphasis on to the younger age of your children's upbringing. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, and you... some mindfulness around those transitions as well as they get older. Um, but want to ask some, some more specific questions in, in this. Um, if it's too late, you know, if you're past that younger age um, and uh, in hindsight can always have done, uh, you know, some things differently. But if you're past that age where your children are no longer in those young phases, if they are an adult, how do you how do you talk to them about it? I know so many parents um, will will just struggle with how do you begin this difficult conversation? I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up, because I think this is this is such a key point. If you get angry, you have already lost. Mm -hmm. If you get angry in talking to a young adult, they will sense and decide that you're mean and you do not love them. And uh, you, you will have lost any opportunity for a conversation to bring them back. So one of the things that I always uh, try to, to emphasize to parents of grown children is you even teenagers you do not get angry you 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 do this let me let me uh, say that you've got to use an awful lot of discipline here but there are some things that you do number one is you never raise your voice you never get loud number two is slow down slow down do not talk fast slow down Make sure that your tones are low and are soft, not loud, fast, and angry. And it takes an awful lot. You need to know your material before you ever discuss things with them. If there is a view that they hold that disagrees with the scripture, you better know your, you better know your stuff. You better have done your homework because they're going to bring up things. If you do not have an answer to something they bring up, say, I, I appreciate you asking me that. I can't answer it right now, but I'll give you an answer. 
You know, you don't have to answer everything today. But I think how you approach that, um, the passage that I like to um, emphasize is in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and um, verse 24, where he talks about the man of God and what the man of God is supposed to be like. And, and I think this is very much, you know, very much a part of how we have to approach young people when we're dealing with them. Uh, if we don't, we're making a terrible mistake. Second Timothy chapter two, those last three verses, 24 to 26. And if I can get these pages, I have this Bible that has thin pages. Don't ever buy a Bible with thin pages. Buy one that you can turn the pages. And I hate a book, a book of the Bible that has been, uh, that has been gilded on the edges. You can never turn them. Okay, Second Peter, uh, Second Timothy, rather, two verse twenty-four, and the Lord's bondservant must look at that word must must not be quarrelsome. You're not going to fuss with them. You're not going to fight with them. But be kind to everyone, even your kids. Able to teach. You know what you're talking about. You're not foolish. Kids always who are just out of college and out of high school and college, they think they know more than their parents. But if you've done your homework and you can answer their questions, you can teach them. Hmm. And patiently enduring evil. If they want to get angry with you, you let them, but you don't respond in kind. Hmm. You never respond in kind. You cannot change what they do, but you can always control what you do. And then it says, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Hmm. Uh, I wish we had more time to, to really get into that. But how you approach them mm -hmm. and whether or not you know what you're talking about has much to do. Now, let me say this, that even whenever you have prayed about it, even whenever you have prepared, even when you have controlled your attitude, you still may not win. Mm. And it may take someone else. You know, sometimes uh, sometimes uh, kids will say, well, there's anybody smarter than my dad, anybody smarter than my mother. And sometimes you may have to have some help with that. I remember one young man who was a, uh, a real serious student of science and he was having doubts mm -hmm. and I introduced uh, his parents to a fellow that I know that lives up in the up in the uh, uh, well lived in Alabama Huntsville Alabama and worked for NASA had a doctor's degree mm -hmm. and uh, a great great guy and I said go and spend a day with him and they flew from California out to spend a day with this, this man. And uh, I, I think it helped their, their son a great deal who was having these doubts. Let me say you have to work towards solutions. And sometimes the solution is not the mama or the daddy, but somebody that this person trusts. Hmm. And uh, it, may, it may be somebody outside the family going to see them. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think that passage that you read um, really just addresses this topic so perfectly and how you can prepare as a parent for it. Um, for time's sake, we're going to have to uh, breeze through a few of these questions, but I think we've we've discussed them a, a bit. Uh, one being, do you handle it differently if they fall into another faith versus if they fall into unbelief? And from some of the, the remarks that you've been saying, I think I hear you saying that uh, you just have to know what they are falling into, whether it's unbelief or whether it's a, another faith, because there's something to research. Well, whatever it is, a doubt or another faith that if you can research it, if you can become an armchair expert of sorts, because you know they have, and they've done the same amount of work, yeah. um, that regardless of the reason for why they're falling away, uh, the response is similar of meet them where they're at with that gentleness, with that um, respect and patience, but but with an understanding of, of their situation. Yeah, being well prepared is huge. Mm -hmm. It's huge, whether it's the matter of, of unbelief or whether it's a matter of false doctrine. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you you have to know their views better than they do. Mm. And even if you do, uh, sometimes their decisions to go the direction they're going has nothing to do with truth. Mm. It has more to do with feeling, mm. with emotion, uh, maybe a, an association with some individual. Mm. So it's 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 um, you can outthink them, but uh, it isn't always successful. Uh, you've got to out you've got to show them love and mm. be patient with them. Mm. And sometimes mm. the best way to, defu- to to defeat a false doctrine is to create doubt in the false doctrine. Mm. To create doubt. And in, in they, they've doubted you. Now you create doubt in them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's a good way to, to deal with it. And um, sometimes uh, that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. But that is one, one technique that you can use. Um, you know, I, the dad of the prodigal son, I am sure he tried all kinds of ways of trying to talk to his boy before the boy decided he just was bound and determined to do what he was going to do. And sometimes you just have to let them have their way and learn for themselves. And that's, that's a hard thing to do. Well, then let's wrap up with um, uh, this last question that uh, I think can be maybe the most difficult aspect of it. Um, If your child's fallen away and they have no indication that they are returning to the church, um, we're assuming that the parent is continuing with these conversations of of serious talks about faith or doubt or or whatever it is continuing to be productive in that area but how do you continue to parent outside of church you know if they go on to have children and you want to be involved in the lives of those children if you want your child to to be around at holidays um, how do you balance the the social and and just emotional aspect of being a parent on this earth with the the spiritual disappointment of them falling away? Well, you know these these children have made their own choices as far as where they're going to go and what they're going to do. But they're still my children, and I still love them, and I I still want to be their, you know, be a father to mm-hmm. to my children and. I would like to hold an open door to my grandchildren. You know, the grandchildren still have souls and maybe they haven't gotten as strong a view uh, as their parents do. And uh, so I, I, uh, uh, does our, you know, do, do the kids and grandkids that have moved away come back home at Christmas time? Of course they do. Mm-hmm. Do we love them just like we do the others? Of course we do. Mm-hmm. But they understand that we do not uh, approve of what they're doing. And there are times when we can make statements without being mean uh, in front of the kids where they, they understand that. Uh, you know, you, you know, you don't quit, you don't quit loving your, your, your son or your daughter because they start smoking. You don't quit loving your son or daughter because they, uh, do do things that you you won't do you don't quit loving them but at the same time love does not mean you approve of every behavior they have love does mean that you care enough about them that you keep your heart open toward them and i think keeping the heart open toward them the you you know we we did not disfellowship our kids our kids disfellowshiped us Mm -hmm. and we want to keep that door open so that we could bring them back and uh, that's not an easy thing yeah and i think that ties into what makes this so difficult is just how do you stay hopeful in these types of situations um because even at a young age i talk to parents um with children still in their house and sometimes it seems like they have just lost hope in in the faithfulness of their children and uh the story of the prodigal son uh, i love and the examples that we see biblically, uh, while we know that free will exists and everyone can make their own choices, uh, the concept that God is greater than any of us and that there's always room for hope. Uh, well, it's it's really easy for good parents to beat themselves up hmm. and and decide that some decision that a child makes 
is because of some something that the parent did years before. And that may may not be the case. Mm-hmm. I don't think the prodigal son's dad was a bad guy. I think sometimes you have people who make their own decisions at their own time in their own way. And, and when they get to a certain age, a certain point in life, there is a hopelessness and a helplessness of the parent. But to, to feel grief, yes. To beat yourself up and feel like it was something you did, that may or may not be the case. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things that I like to, to point out to parents is that, yes, I know what Proverbs 22, 6 says, but I also know that that is a general truth, not an absolute one. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, uh, you know, kids uh, have their own ways. The, the generation that lived when Joshua was alive was one of the best generations, biblically speaking, mm-hmm. of all time. Mm-hmm. But there was another generation that grew up that did not share their values. And I don't think it was because the older generation quit on them or didn't teach them. Mm-hmm. I think it's just that it became popular and it became uh, uh, it became something they looked at the other nations around them and wanted to be like them more than they wanted to be like their mamas and daddies. Right. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking uh, for any parent who loves the Lord and wants their children to go to heaven to watch them walk away and not be what they ought to be. But I do want to say that these kinds of problems have happened since the beginning of time. Adam and Eve had a Cain and had an Abel Hmm. and had a Seth. And um, sometimes kids stay faithful and sometimes they don't. I think about situation of uh, Abraham and Isaac Isaac and Rebecca were probably two of the most dysfunctional parents that ever were. And uh, a lot of problems with Jacob and Esau. And sometimes uh, it happens that even though Abraham was the kind of father who would command his children to follow the Lord. Genesis 18, verse 19. And so you have that kind of a a situation that takes place. Uh, Your heart aches, but there are some things over which you cannot you don't have any control other than pray about it and be there for the children when they need you. Well, that's uh, all the time that we have, but Phil, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your, just your openness in this conversation and and your wisdom as well, but thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Landon, and God bless those who'll be listening and studying with you. Mm -hmm.